Another thing is when you have 300 vessels coming into your port and you need to decide which one you're going to inspect. Mm -hmm. And there are some yeah, companies, agencies, NGOs that are working on specific algorithms and digital technologies that make it a hell of a lot easier. Right. So what one of them did mm -hmm. was to come up with five indicators. So basically they took all the vessels that had a history of non-compliance right. with labor, labor yeah. issues. Yeah. And then they compared those, I think it was 200 or so, with all of the fishing fleet. And they tried to see what were the correlations in terms of the characteristics of those vessels. So is there a particular engine type mm -hmm. that tends to be bad with labor? Is there a particular distance from port that they tend to fish at? Is there a particular number of voyages per year? Working hours, they actually managed to calculate by comparing the amount of crew on board and the amount of fish that they fish. So they're able to calculate how long it takes to do each activity and therefore whether it's likely that they're going way And they're realistically them. staffed. Yes, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that one is length of time at sea. So how often do they call into port? Because a lot of these vessels, they stay on the high seas for years and then they have smaller boats that come with food and water supplies and they'd go back with the fish. So the fishers are there for years without actually seeing land. So they've come up with these indicators that mar managed to narrow down the number of vessels to, okay, these ones are not necessarily guaranteed to have issues on board, but it's a form of profiling that makes it yeah. easier to then do the next step. Right. I think uh, when interviewing the captain or the skipper, how easily you can get him to admit that he's holding people in situations of forced labor. You say, do you have their passports? Yes, they're all in this uh, padlocked thing. Why? To prevent them from running away because they want to go home, but I need them to stay. And you're like, I really didn't expect you to be so honest about that. <laughs> so it's completely normalized. All of these uh, violations are completely normalized in the yeah. sector. It's not something that people even try to hide because it's considered to be normal practice right. in a lot of cases. So. Here when you've listed things what to look for, sort of telltale signs for, ooh, potentially here is something going wrong, right? So you, you mentioned some of those. There's, uh, there's eight indicators, yeah. but perhaps just before we yeah. go to this, to, to come back to, yeah. to your questions, there's a lot of yeah. very good questions that you ask. What we usually um, try to advise mm -hmm is first to ask the skipper because he will give you you know one version of the story then you interview fishers outside of the skipper's view and with several fishers so that there couldn't that cannot be some uh, uh how do you say in english retaliation against any of the fisher which happens extremely often when they speak to employers and you try always to cross check with physical visits so then you go over the boat and you verify things you verify things and you verify documents mm -hmm. So when you know you will ask first for the passports, you check the age. Do you have any child labor on there? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or, uh, where are the passports kept? Are they uh, available to to workers? That so you go basically the eleven indicators of forced labor. You check them one by one. Living condition. Where do you sleep? How many people uh, you know in this deck? We've seen you know people that live. What we visited with Alison in different countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they really sleep in areas that are high like this, 25 people. Uh, so you have to check that. Usually they turn because some of them, you have two, you know, things. Yeah. So those who are on the top, they go here one week and then they go back under and then they go up. Some of them sleep even on the deck. Um, in Ghana, recently we went, they called it Monkey Islands, um, which you can imagine is a terrific terminology to use, but this is really used by the industry to call where the fishers sleep. It's on the top of the vessel, you know, with basically you are not protected from the wind, from the heat, from the sea. You would not survive for sure more than a few days. Um, and psychologically, it's extremely difficult. So, I mean, there's really, the, the objective of the, of the inspector is to, to triangulate the information. Yeah. Can I have a question? You were saying before, and to go back to your uh, scenario, when you go to the vessels, you ask the captain, he says very bluntly, yes, I have all the passports, you do your checklist, you see as well all of this. 
then what happens? I mean, you've seen this, and then do you shut down operation? Do you force the vessel to stay on, on, in the port? So what happens? So there are several solutions. That's a very good question. Uh, normally, that should be highlighted in national legislation, um, which is not always the case. Mm -hmm. For example, to give you a very concrete example, in South Africa, in uh, July of last year, following a, a training that we had done with the South African Maritime Authority, they inspected a vessel, uh, a foreign flag vessels uh, in the Durban port, and they found a lot of non-compliances. They decided to detain the vessel, meaning the vessel cannot go out of the port mm -hmm. to detain the vessel until all the non-compliances were addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's in fact very costly for employers because you know one day in port where you are not fishing, yeah. so you lose the profit from the fishing, plus uh, you know you have to cover also all the costs for the fishers, the food, etc. So it's uh, you know it's a bold decisions from the authority. So you can either detain the vessel um, for a number of days. This is the most common um, thing that is used until the vessel can can uh, go back to fish. Then there could be also no entry into ports. This is where this is a major area which is quite interesting because it's you have a bit of a conflict of interest between the environmental issues and the labor issues because if you are a port state you have a foreign vessel that call into your port you review all the different documents that Alison spoke about and you think oh this vessel in fact might be involved in illegal fishing in IUU fishing mm -hmm. because of those indicators so your option is to say okay I do not allow you to enter my port which means this vessel will you know not enter your port uh, which also means that, yes, you are forbidding this vessel to enter, but what about the fishers that are on this vessel, which we know there are, it's not a 100% correlation, mm -hmm. but there are more risk mm -hmm. also than those vessels have poor conditions that you might want to inspect. Mm -hmm. So what we are saying is that it's better to leave those vessels enter your port and then to launch a labor inspection that could actually yeah. determine you know, the conditions. But all of this is also costly for broad authorities and it's also politically sometimes sensitive. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. May I ask if these indicators, and like, do you train the labor inspectorate on these potential indicators? Yes, exactly. We train them on all those indicators. Um, what you can see is that there's what we say is, for example, you look at the manning of every vessel. Yeah. We know that for this type of vessel, it's a minimum of 20 fishers. Otherwise, you know, you would have to work overtime. So if there's not a good ratio, it's mm -hmm. a big indicator. Days at sea, we already discussed. The longer at sea, the longer isolated, the higher risk of exploitation. Mm -hmm. Crew list mismatch. Every vessel has a crew list. So if you see that there is, it's not matching, there's something fishy. Uh, in, in validating, yeah, that's a term we, we always use in the sector. <laughs> Other type of, you know, violation is obviously also um, an indicator. Uh, repetitive uniform hours records, uh, it's, we know that in fishing, as Doro mentioned, every day is different. It's a um, hunting activity, you hunt the fish. So every day is different, you don't know. So if you see when you arrive on the vessel, give me the hour records as a labor inspector, I want to verify it. You see that all the hours are the same. You're thinking, okay, they did that five minutes before. It cannot be really realistic. Same for the pay. In fact, that's one of the sector where your pay is so complex. Um, so it was a good thing what you ask about pay slips. Yeah. You know, when you say, show me the pay slips, because usually every month they should issue also a pay slip. In, in fishing, you, you, you pay a basic wage, then you pay a part of the catch, a percentage of the catch. So if the vessel fish a lot, then they give, you know, a part normally to the fishers, a percentage of this part to the fishers. And then because the person is, is on board the vessel for a very long time, you know, they, they buy products. So they have a lot of deductions which is also uh, very complex. Imagine after 11 months, sometimes, mm -hmm. you have to review your deductions. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to verify. Right. Yeah. 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 
So, and the last one, maybe we didn't explain it, but that's a key term when um, you think about the fishing industry, transshipment. Mm -hmm. um, this is, if a vessel stay at sea for very long time, you cannot keep the fish for a very long time on the vessel, even if they have some refrigerated, yeah. you know, uh, container on the vessel. So you have to give the fish to another vessel. So you have those transshipment vessels that comes to you at sea. You offload your catch at sea. They come back and they would offload, you know, in the port. Mm -hmm. So it's in fact very difficult to know where the fish is coming from because those vessels that come take the fish from the many vessels on the sea, they sometimes mix the fish together. So where does it come from? Is a, sometimes a very tricky question. Um, and certifying products, you know, you're even more unrealistic. Though. Exactly. Transshipment is very challenging for certification. Mm -hmm. Very. Yes. Um, just to loop back a little bit with what Kate was asking about how you see these violations, potential violations, and they get detained until they're addressed. Are you saying you just let the captain say, oh, please give the passports back to your crew and then go back? Because, I mean, typically there is national legislation about forced labor and that person has committed a crime. Mm -hmm. So at what stage does it become as a criminal, yeah. and you say this captain is not allowed to go back to sea, these are victims of crime, they're going to receive uh, support, and our trafficking victims will, and then, you know, kind of elevate it to that level, rather than just saying, oh, I hope it's better next time, go back to sea. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite what they did in South Africa, so um, one of the fishers was very, very injured, and he was literally, he would have died quite soon after that, had he not been taken to hospital, so he was in hospital for 10 days. The fishers, after everything was resolved in terms of you now have a contract, you've been paid, the fishers were given the option, do you want to stay on the vessel or do you want to go home? Half of them chose to go home. So they were repatriated and they had to pay for their own flight because South Africa hasn't yet ratified the right. protocol on forced labour that would obligate them to facilitate that repatriation. Um, but half of them chose to go back on the vessel. Then in terms of next steps, do you then not let that vessel come back? Uh, do you want to press criminal charges? That's really up to the authorities. It's a, yeah. It's a Obviously that step. would be the ideal solution yeah. uh, and something that we promote. Um, one thing also that the Convention 188 says is that when you arrest a vessel, when you detain a vessel in your port and you check violation, you are supposed to write a report to the flag state mm. to let them know this is one of your vessel, it has violated international labor standards. So normally when the vessel go back also at some point to the country. But but yeah, this is a very challenging industry because, yeah. because of all of this. It's easier with uh, national flag vessels than with foreign flag vessels. If you look at the detention of foreign flag vessels in the world, it's extremely yes. low. to Sarah's just about so yes you said you don't automatically go to criminal charges it's not as not easy to do that but if you were to prosecute would it be the captain of the vessel or would you go a step higher and then if yes then you put on which flag and it's, it, it feels like it becomes complicated again <laughs> <laughs> yes yes it's a it's a very good question so you have um, sometimes you can have a flag and a company owning the vessel that is not uh, registered in the country of the flag, which makes it quite difficult. What, um, what, there's also what we call beneficial ownership, so which means a vessel is on the paper owned by a company, but in fact there's another company behind. Uh, there's a lot of problems like this because some of the countries are mandating nationals to own all the vessels, but they don't have, for example, the capital to invest in those vessels. So they bring capital from you know, other countries. For example, in Ghana, um, where we were recently, most of the Ghanaian flag vessels uh, are owned by Chinese companies. Um, so um, yes, I mean, the, the company owners should be responsible and should be Ban. And this is also something that is quite interesting on 
you know, some of the listing of those regional fisheries management organization that Charles told you about, they list vessels that are um, guilty of illegal fishing, but not uh, uh, companies that own those vessels. And a company usually, I mean, especially big company in fishing, they own many vessels. So it's only the vessels that are targeted, not the company level yet. And this is something that I think needs to be looked at in the future. Uh, you know, when a vessel is, is, is listed on those IUU lists, uh, the link needs to be made with the company. Yeah. But these um, guys yes. 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 are trying to help with the <laughs> figuring out the mess of who owns what and where is my fish really coming from. So these are a list of digital technology actors that are trying to help address false labor in fishing. And these ones at the bottom are the ones that will be most interesting for you guys in the business. Uh, so they have databases that you have to pay for, and they can help you analyze the databases to try and work out exactly where your fish is, is coming from. So not just a vessel violation, but who owned the vessel and who previously owned the vessel, who now owns the vessel, etc., etc. So. Um, there is help out there, it's yeah. not all doom and gloom. Yeah. Um, the ones at the top provide services to workers, so Spyglass and the, this Spyglass, they can, I don't know whether many fishers would have heard of it, but they technically could use it because it's an open source. They could look at the vessel they've been contracted to work on and see if there are any previous violations. Um, these guys try to bring connectivity to fishing vessels. Uh, so they can access the internet and ITF, the International Transport Workers Federation, they have an app as well that fishers can use so no matter what port they go into they can look up the number of an inspector, the number of a union uh, to try and get help. <laughs> and then these guys are more focused on the inspectors so what I've already explained about narrowing down uh, the risk. But these guys are the ones that if you ever end up working for a company that is in any way related to fishing these are the guys that you should look into partnering with to, to help you with traceability. Mm -hmm.